Bridge building. That is why we are here today to remember Justice Delay. To remember all we have endured. To seek and secure justice, delay and deny. Hmm, since 1865 and how far we have yet to go. Woke about our human suffering, pain and the resources we have given to this country. Okay, welcome. We're so glad you are here to our state of Illinois leaders, municipal dis dignitaries, community stakeholders. We're especially honored to receive Join the meeting, you. And I'm gonna give you yeah. a pass. A huge hug to our fellow social advocates and teammates, Sierra Club Kaskaskia Group, Moms Demand Action, Indivisible Metro East, and United Congregations Metro East. Welcome, welcome. As we move through today and go on this journey in honor of Black history in Juneteenth, we'll pause each time and reflect on a very poignant speech, a place in history right around Civil War, um, the Gettysburg Address. So we'll read the first verse now. <clears throat> Mr. Taylor, you are muted, Mr. Taylor. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Absolutely. So today we have special honored guests who give their time and keep their boots on the ground in honor of equity and liberty. Today we have Senator Chris Belt of the 57th District. We have Representative Latoya Greenwood of the 114th District. Alvin, Alvin Park, Park of the of East, East St. Louis, Louis Township. Mayor Robert Eastern the third, City of East St. Louis. Mayor Vera Banks of the oldest and the most beautiful Brooklyn, Illinois. We have Mayor Curtis McCall wonderful village of Cahokia, Illinois, and the awesome village administrator and mayor's assistant, Francella Jackson, Cahokia, Illinois, Mayor Ricky Thomas from Washington Park, Illinois, mm -hmm. the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation president, Steve Williams, the National Juneteenth Observance Director of Communications, Miss D. Evans. Yeah, thank you. We have the most awesome Lorenzo Savage. I am East St. Louis, the magazine. And of course, this event is hosted by Community Development Sustainable Solutions, Pillars of Excellence for the State of Illinois. Today, we represent Juneteenth East St. Louis, our new statewide Illinois Juneteenth committee. And as always, all things Juneteenth, as we stand under the umbrella of the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation. So now let's take a look at who some of these leaders are as they give a brief hello. Mr. Steve Williams, NJOF. Holla if you hear me. Hello, hello, thank you very much. My name is Steve Williams, president of the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation. 
which was founded and created by the Reverend Ronald V. Myers, Sr. MD, Doc, as we all call him and known to love him. The National Jew Team Observance Foundation's mission is to bring all Americans together to celebrate our common bond of freedom through the recognition and preservation of Juneteenth, the historic preservation of Juneteenth in America. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to have been raised in a Juneteenth environment, celebrating Juneteenth from a youth and commemorating it from California to Colorado to Kansas to Mississippi. Um, everywhere we went, my family was Juneteenth and um, Doc and our family crossed many trails together, both being from Oklahoma. So I am extremely privileged and honored to um, pick up the banner and to help lead the charge to get the National Day of Observance and Juneteenth on the calendar. And I appreciate all of you in the Juneteenth Nation for your diligence and support, especially over the last few years, as we really push hard to make this a reality. Thank you very much. Absolutely. And all sir. things Juneteenth. All things Juneteenth, sir. All right, and we have the lovely Miss D. Evans the Communications Director for Juneteenth Observance Foundation. Good afternoon and thank you for having me. I am Dee Evans and I am a Chicagoan. I'm, I'm currently living in Las Vegas, but I am and always will be part of Illinois. I was mentored by Lestine Byers who obtained the Juneteenth legislation in Chicago originally. She brought me into the Juneteenth movement and she introduced me to Dr. Myers when I, when I relocated to Las Vegas. And I spent uh, about 14 years working with him closely. And now I'm working with our, new pre our current president, Mr. Stephen Williams. And I'm very proud of everything that we're doing. Uh, we have a number of, of, uh, a number of projects going on that I would love to have you join us on Saturdays on our conference call so we can tell you more about what the National Unit is doing. All things June thinks, and thank you for everything. All things June team. Okay, what about our lovely National Miss June team? Did you know that we had a National June team, Queen? This is something that we brought about in our first year in 2020. Miss Sanaya states, I pride myself in being a natural leader creative problem solver, a great communicator. These are all qualities that I believe are characteristics the National Juneteenth Queen should possess. The attributes can bring, I can bring to the program are interpersonal skills, teamwork, and a strong work ethic. Absolutely. And we are so proud of her. Is Ms. Sanaya on the call at the moment? No, she is not. She is trying to get in. If, if, if she's unable to get in, it's asking her for a past um, meeting ID and passcode. Good afternoon, Stephanie. Good afternoon. Um, absolutely. And could you say something about Miss Sanaya as we get her on? The passcode is 922-967. All right. Uh, I just sent it to her. No, I didn't. Hold on. <laughs> 922967. She's on the phone yeah. with me. My name okay. is Sylvia Lewis Harris, and I am the president of the Delaware Juneteenth Association. Um, we have been celebrating um, Juneteenth for the past 20, this will be our 27th year. Um, we too have, um, we cherish our history and freedom, um, and we try to bring it to everyone around the world in the country and around the world. Uh, Sanaya is 18 years old. She was formerly Miss, Del Miss Juneteenth Delaware. And uh, after competing in the scholarship program, the National Miss Juneteenth Scholarship Program at um, Memphis with NJOF, she was crowned the, the inaugural National Miss Juneteenth. So she is very, very excited, very happy. And she is gung-ho about um, making Juneteenth a national holiday and her platform, which is um, domestic violence prevention 
and she says, log in to Juneteenth.us and sign the petition. <laughs> Absolutely. And I thank you so much for that. Um, later, as we talk about why we're loving our direction, I would like to give you and our lovely queen an opportunity to chime in on why we're so happy about where we're going. Thank, thank you. you. Sanaya just made it in as well. Absolutely. Miss Sanaya, would you like to say hello, queen? Hello, everyone. How are you today? <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. We're so honored that you represent us. You are so beautiful and talented. And as we move through the program, we'll give you an opportunity to speak more about your platform, okay? Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, we're just so tickled pink about her. <laughs> and then of course, we have our awesome state senator, Illinois 57th District, Christopher Belt in the house. Uh, Christopher, I had to put up these moving poses because that's how we feel about him. Um, he honors us in every step he's been taking as he's taken on such a heavy role for our state. Senator Belt, are you on the call yet, sir? I haven't seen his, his name come up yet. Okay, well, he shall be here. We'll move on to the Honorable Miss Latoya Greenwood, State Representative oh, oh, of the God. Illinois 114th District. Uh, Miss Latoya Greenwood, could you say hello, uh, Representative? Hey. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. So Stephanie and Terrence have been on this um, Everyone, please mute yourself in respect uh, for the program. Thank you. Stephanie and Terrence have been on this journey with Juneteenth for a long time. And I would like to think and to say that I've been right there with them every step of the way. So you have. this is an exciting time. And I'm just happy to um, work with you, th you all on all things Juneteenth and what I can do to support in the state of Illinois. Thank you. Absolutely, ma'am. Again, thank you. And as always, we have the village of Cahokia's very own Mayor Curtis McCall and Francella Jackson, the mayor's assistant. And just as the uh, picture states, they've always been there as well. Um, we, we can't say enough about the respect and love that we have for this village, this community, their history and their direction. Please say, say hello without giving away your direction on where we're going yet. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Good afternoon uh, to everyone. I'm Mayor Curtis McCall Jr., the mayor of the wonderful village of Cahokia. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here to uh, you guys, Stephanie and Terrence, and all of our distinguished guests this uh, afternoon. So I just would like to say thank you for the invite and uh, we appreciate all of your efforts in making this a national holiday. Absolutely, sir. Thank you and bless you. Ms. Jackson? Unmute, unmute, Francella. <laughs> I'm sorry. Let me start over. To the Taylors, as Representative Greenwood said, they've always been on the forefront of this Juneteenth celebration. It is an honor to be on the call with my boss, Mayor Curtis McCall, who was the first mayor in this area to issue a proclamation for Juneteenth. So thank you, Mayor McCall, for your leadership in that, in that effort. It's also an Absolutely. honor to be on the call with Mayor Banks. As you know, Brooklyn is the first Black town just an honor. So I'm going to enjoy this program. And, and as, a, as an abolitionist said that she could free more people if only knew they were free, we're going to have to let our people know that we are free. We're going to have to let them know to be free because this country is ours. We built the White House. We built the Capitol. We did a lot of things. It's time for us to let our people know that we are free and take back our country. Thank you. 
Thank you, Francella Jackson, administrator of the Village of Cahokia. Again, our honor and, and support in everything that you all do. You all are the best. Thank you so much. Now, without further ado, just as we were stating, we have the lovely Mayor Banks who has agreed to be with us today. The village of Brooklyn, Illinois is the only black town founded in the US in the 1800s and survives as a living community. Priscilla Baltimore is locally remembered and respected as the founding mother of this town. Mayor Banks, please say hello. Good morning, hello everyone. Um, happy Valentine's Day. And I wanna thank you for inviting me. This is the first Juneteenth um, a Zoom call that I've uh, been invited to attend, um, to participate in. Uh, Brooklyn is one of the older, is the oldest co not unincorporated community, African-American community in the United States of America. And I'm very, very proud and honored to be called the mayor. Um, I wear the title, the title doesn't wear me. I have an open door policy. I wanna thank uh, Senator Belk, uh, State Representative Greenwood for all of your support and the way that you guys come through for the Village of Brooklyn. We are a proud community. And um, you know what? On Friday, we vaccinated 180 people in the Village of Brooklyn. Thanks wow. to Eastside Hill District and the good work of the National Guard. Uh, I'm proud to say that. And I just want everyone to stay safe, wear your mask, practice safe distancing, and wash your hands. Have a great day. We honor you and we love you. And we're so happy that you're here, Mayor Banks. You're a very strong woman, very strong willed, <laughs> very opinionated. And that is what our oldest community needs in order to thrive and survive. So thank you for being who you are. Thank you. The city of East St. Louis, Illinois, Mayor Robert Eastern III, sir, are you on the call? I haven't seen him or, or Sarah yet as well. Okay, all right. We will move on to the East St. Louis Township Supervisor. Nor Alvin. Nor Alvin, I just sent him a message. Okay, thank you very much. I did <laughs> see Ricky Thomas, Mayor of Washington Park, Illinois. How are you doing today, sir? And I know when we stopped by and told him about Juneteenth, when we talked to him about the census and the importance of that, he's always answered our call, always been there, just as well as he wanted to make sure that his community honored Juneteenth. That was one of the first things he did when he took office there. Mm -hmm. Sir, can you say hello? Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? All right. <laughs> I'd just like to uh, recognize Juneteenth. Uh, Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day, Jubilee Day, Liberation Day, and Emancipation Day. It's a holiday celebrating the emancipation of those who had been enslaved in the United States. Now, Juneteenth in Gavison, Texas, is now celebrated on the 19th of June throughout the United States. Juneteenth is commemorated on the anniversary date of June 8, 19, 1865, announcement by, announcement by Army General Gordon Granger proclaiming freedom from slavery in Texas. So therefore, as, after becoming a man in the village of Washington Park, knowing that we needed to honor and recognize those who had been enslaved throughout the United States and those who received their freedom in Texas, we recognized Juneteenth as a holiday in the village of Washington Park, where we are, I'm sure the first community who recognize that holiday and give our employees the day off on Juneteenth. I'm moving there. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, sir. And you keep doing you what you're doing. <laughs> it's an honor. <laughs> All right, I am East St. Louis, the magazine, Mr. Lorenzo Savage and Charmaine Savage, 
the founders of such a wonderful voice for our community to let people know that we have people that live and love here in our town. Are you on the phone, sir? Uh, good morning, everyone, and happy Valentine's Day to all you beautiful ladies out there. I want all to right. first thank you, Community Development Sustainable Solutions, for, for continuing the great work that you guys do. You know, the census work that you guys have done, I think we all need to give y'all a hand because throughout all the communities, Washington Park, Centerville, Cahokia, all those communities, East St. Louis, you guys stepped up to the plate and really got our numbers up. You know, and so I'm just happy to be here to, uh, you know, recognize uh, the need for Juneteenth. We know that there were people in Texas, like like the mayor said, you know, who didn't get the message until a month later. Right. You know, so we need to take this opportunity as well to recognize that Black people, you know, of slave descent need mm -hmm. reparations. We have been marginalized. We have been uh, set aside. We have not had opportunity in any realm of, of economic development to truly be a part of the American system. So I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And I want to say that I am East St. Louis recognized in Washington Park, Cahokia, Centerville. You all have, you know, Allison, all of the five boroughs. You all have people that we will start recognizing now. I'm telling you this right now that I am East St. Louis will recognize those people as well as people from East St. Louis, you know, uh, until you get your own magazine. And I hope that happens. So thank you, Stephanie. All and right. Gary. I thank Gary. you for saying that, uh, Mr. Savage, um, as the owner of the magazine, um, because it really is our whole Southern Illinois region that needs to be uplifted. And thank God you've got the heart to see hey, you know, that you can spread it out a bit. So thank you, sir. And thank right. you for being here. All right. We can't forget Brooklyn either. And uh, our senator just left me a message and said he's hopping on now. Okay. Very <laughs> good. Very good. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, Mr. Taylor, you want to take this slide away, sir? Okay. Now, it's, it's kind of small, but I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, CDS, <laughs> CDS says is an organization of professional people living and working in the same community we serve. We create and foster feelings of fellowship with others sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. As grassroots agents, we innovate updated process, outdated okay. processes. <laughs> yeah, we innovate. Okay, wait, let me go again. As grassroots agents, we innovative, outdated processes, engaging citizens so we may take collective action resulting in solutions we can apply to common problems. We are transforming agents, providing relevant programs and events with a mission to create and sustain community and economic development. CDSS East St. Louis remains true to its vision and mission towards equitable and sustainable solutions to end systemic racism and crime via community and economic development efforts that civically engage. Our focus areas are education and workforce development, environmental and economic sustainability, social equity, and Juneteenth, the National Obs Day of Observance, baby. <laughs> Absolutely. And as always, um, you can get involved with our work readiness programs. We're very keen on parent involvement. And we realize that through a statewide program, parent mentor program. And we also have a national apprentice program where we are building teachers and paraprofessionals across the state of Illinois. So again, as we said during this program, um, as we begin this round of questions and this review of our history today, we will reflect now on the second verse of the Gettysburg Address. We've determined who all the troops are on the field and we've all said hello. But now we are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those 
who have gave their lives that that nation might live, it is altogether fitting and proper that we should do that. So here we go. The first place we're gonna visit is the People's Grocery Store. Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Will Stewart, all African-Americans and co-owners of the People's Grocery Store located at this site. They were arrested in connection with the disturbance near their store. Rather than being brought to trial, they were lynched on March 9th, 1892. Moss's dying words were, tell my people to go west because there is no justice for them here. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> now that we're looking at each other. You know, 1892, you know, there was an editorial published two months later. The first in what would be her famed anti-lynching series, Wells specifically called out the murder of the three grocers while debunking the trope of black men raping white women a common pretext used to justify lynchings. We also have Senator Belt has joined us as well, Stephanie. Senator Belt, would you like to say hello, sir? Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I apologize for my tardiness. I uh, was on another uh, Zoom. I was trying to get off of to get on this one, um, but I'm, I'm glad to be here and look forward to uh, learning information and, and being a part of this dialogue. Thank you, sir. We're honored that you're here. Even more honored that one of the first things you did as our state senator was went straight to our capital and began to tell your constituents about the work towards Juneteenth and its advocacy. We thank you for that and we honor you for that. And the result of that was an attendance of our, our Lieutenant Governor, Juliana Stratton. So thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you. And, and, and again, you guys may have already gone over this, but it is very uh, important that, that Juneteenth becomes a national recognized holiday. Uh, it's, it's important, and, and I said this before, uh, and I'll underscore it again, it's important because it, it, it should be America's holiday. It's, 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 in theory, it's the ending, uh, it's the abolishment of, of slavery. You know, the, the, the war ended in May of, of 1865. And, and when you put it in today's context, it's, it seems way out there. You know, you can, you can get uh, information to somebody just like that. Mm -hmm. But a, it took a Union soldier a month and 10 days later, June 19th, to get that word into- to, to, wait, 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 hold, 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 I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I have to I have to make a point as you say that. It was not a Union soldier. They were US colored troops, the Illinois 29th. It was black men from Illinois who landed in Galveston and told the majority of people they were free. Granger was an add-on second. Know your history and be proud of that. They saw them black Illinois, men in the uniforms <laughs> with guns from Illinois and New York rushed there. They weren't even on their way to Galveston. They were on their way to Mexico. They stopped in Galveston, and Galveston had black soldiers, black sailors on the on the shore, stopped mm -hmm. on the outside saying, you can't come in. It was those black men from Illinois and New York who came in and saw what was going on and went back and told Granger, that's why it wasn't order number one or order number two, but order number three. Those black men went and told everybody one, and you guys need to understand the importance of that, that you had the foot 
on the ground. They came there. They didn't have a choice. They had a choice. They were free men from Illinois. Like, 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 you'll see in the newspaper by our guy, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. I heard so no, many no, no, times. No, 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 go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 like William Costley, the young man freed by Abraham Lincoln when he was 10 months old, him and his three, him and his three brothers-in-law and his father-in-law joined the army to fight, and they were the ones that came there. So it wasn't like that. Understand, right there where that happened, you have the heritage and the and the foundation in Juneteenth. We explained that to Danny Davis and Caleb Gilchrist mm -hmm. and his whole staff. That's why they're in there throwing left and rights trying to make it happen. Understand well, I, where I, you're understand where you guys are. I know you don't know, so it just ate to me to understand you guys have the legacy, you guys have the history right there under your nose, and you're not aware of it. Understand it. Illinois 29, black men right from there in soldier in uniform came aboard in Galveston and said, Y'all are free June 18th. Ranger came back on the 19th and at gunpoint with them pointing guns at some people tell them, hey, they're free. He did post it on Reedy Chapel. He did do those other things. It wasn't their top priority. But to those black men, by them coming out of Illinois with their heads held high, carrying guns, these same group of black men that helped capture General Lee at Appomattox and then were mustered to Fort Monroe, the same group. Right there out of Illinois, y'all stand up and be proud about your contribution to Juneteenth. Okay, that's, awesome. that's a great national, thing. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to Juneteenth. be so passionate, but you know the passion is there. The passion that's is the there. That's the national and, Juneteenth and president. Thank you, thank you for sharing that. I mean, that's what uh, I, I always say: knowledge is to, is to be given, and so thank you. Uh, but to that point, that still underscores the importance of. The fact that it's it should be a national holiday and and yes it's it's black folk uh it impacted us but it, it's it's the ending it's the, the in theory the abolishment of, of american slavery right and that's, that's something that we should be a proud of not just as black people but as a country the original sin the getting rid of it and we know the the ratification of the the 13th amendment came six months later but this was huge right here. And so this is what we need to celebrate. So I, I, I'm, I'm for it. It's, it's, it's a long time coming. I, I think Texas was the first state to recognize it in 1980. Guys, we're in 2021. Let's, hmm. let's get this thing done. Absolutely, Senator. Absolutely. So again, you know, after looking at what happened there at the People's Grocery Store, you know, Ida B. Wells, she saw that. She saw that, you know. And from there, Ida said, you know, she asserted that these atrocities were far more often about squashing Black economic progress. And it was an excuse to, to, rid, to get rid of Negroes who were acquiring wealth and property and thus keep the race terrorized and get the in people down. Her editorial prompted a violent attack on Wells, on her newspaper office and threats subsequently on Ida's life. You know, so again, like I said, some of these images that we are looking at, we're just going to take this walk. We're going to, we're taking this walk. So heeding her friend's warning, you know, she encouraged black people, you know, hey, y'all, we need to get out of here because just like she heard, you know, um, there is no, no, they don't value us here. So more than 6,000 people turned around and fled with Ida during that time. Which leads us to Emmett. You know, on August 28th, 1955, while visiting family in Money, Missouri, 14 year old Emmett Till, an African American from Chicago, is brutally murdered for allegedly, allegedly flirting with a white woman 
four days earlier. Just four days earlier. You know, the Emmett Till murder trial brought to light the brutality of Jim Crow segregation in the South and was an early impetus to the civil rights movement. And you know, in 2017, it took all the way until 2017 when an author by the name of Tim Tyson wrote a book called The Blood of Emmett Till and revealed that Carolyn Bryant, the woman who alleged that she was attacked or touched, she said she had never been touched, threatened, or harassed. She said nothing that that boy could have ever done could have justified what happened to that boy. Let's take one more look here. And let's move on to these images. Thomas Shipp and Abraham Smith. <laughs> Those were the two guys from the grocery store who did get murdered by way of lynching. James Cameron was the third young boy. But when it was his turn, Cameron, with the noose already around his neck, was improbably, it had to have been God some way, there was a voice out of the crowd that proclaimed that he was innocent. You've got Trayvon Martin. Somehow in between Trayvon being on the phone with his girlfriend and deciding to start running and the neighborhood watch man chasing him, he ended up dying less than a hundred yards from his front door. So the question that I have for everybody today on the panel is, when is the first time in your life that you experienced racism and that you actually knew in your heart that it existed? And what did you do to overcome it? I'm gonna start with State Representative Greenwood or do you want me to go to some, if you want to cheat and say, go to someone else first, I'll go to someone else. First. <laughs> um, I can start with mine. Mine was in high school and it was a high school counselor. And um, I was letting her know about my intentions for college. And she proceeded to tell me that she thought that some a uh, local community college would be a great choice for me mm -hmm. um, at this time. And could, did I really think that I could get into the schools that I were, was applying for, ab applying to get into? So that was my um, first taste at racism and the way people perceive you. There are already um, biases implanted in them on the way they view black people, um, black students. And it was something that could have been very discouraging, but it was not because, um, you know, I was just thinking she is really out of her mind, but, um, but it was just something even more for me to prove to her that um, not only her, but people like her that not only can I apply, but I can get into these colleges, which I did. So that, that was my encounter. <laughs> that was at Al Pop Catholic High School. So, wow. So, yeah. Which college? Well, I which attended Michigan State University. Yeah. So, <laughs> but um, I had plenty of uh, offers to attend, but that was the one I chose. So thanks. Thank you. Senator Bell? Uh, mine was uh, my freshman year at Illinois State. I, I was uh, walking back to uh, my apartment and as I, it was about 10 o'clock that night, 
walking back to an apartment and a, a, a car uh, came down the street and they threw a, a, a cup at me, a red cup. And they told me to go back to Africa, you monkey. And that was the yeah. first time I had ever uh, personally had had experienced anything like that, you know, coming from a, uh, a predominantly black school district like East St. Louis, you, you just, you weren't exposed to that. And so when I was at college, uh, 17 years old, that's when that happened to me. And, and it's just built up a resolve in me just to uh, show up and show up even more. So that's Kudos it. Kudos to you. Kudos to you. Uh, Mr. Williams, Steve Williams, how about you, sir? Uh, I have to give a disclaimer first, okay? <laughs> um, I have grown a lot in my years, okay? And, um, and, and I have learned to temper myself a lot uh, with that. But I will tell you the first time I experienced uh, racism, I, my family, I grew up in a military family and we went to go live with my mom in Denver, Colorado. People don't know much about Denver and this history there and I, I won't go into it, but Denver was one of the most segregated cities in America in the 70s. Yeah. It was so segregated that they forced busing, right? And they blew up buses, they set them on fire. They tried to attack them and shot them with that. I was bused <coughs> from, um, Park Hill, uh, the, the beautiful black neighborhood of Park Hill, home of Philip Bailey and Pam Greer and Hattie McDaniel and all them. We were bused from the beautiful neighborhood of Park Hill and we were bused to South Denver. And I was in junior high school, seventh grade, and there was a 7-Eleven down the street from the school. So I decided I would go to the 7-Eleven before school because we got there. Denver schools are big. I'm walking down the alley and four five white boys come up to me and say, hey, what you doing? And I said, I'm going to the store. Not in our neighborhood. One punched me in the head. I hadn't been punched in the head before, but I knew one thing. I took off. <laughs> Boom, I ran. I said, never again. They couldn't catch me. The next day, that weekend, my brother and I went across the city bus all the way back to the neighborhood, and I put a pile of alley apples in a stick there. And I waited the next Monday and they chased me down the alley. And when they came around the corner, they all got cracked. And I got back to school and I was suspended. And I spent the next two years doing stuff like that um, <laughs> in the school. <laughs> uh, OK, how about you? How about you, uh, Mayor Curtis McCall? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm not going to uh, go as <laughs> far as the, the first, but I'm going to give you the most recent uh, as okay. it would apply. Uh, back on April the 7th of 2015, I won the election to become the, uh, the mayor of the village of Cahokia. Yes, and so for those of you who don't know, I became the first black mayor of the village of Cahokia's history, which was established years and centuries ago almost. And so leading up to that election, there was a lot of racial undertone within the city. And basically it was almost if you elect this black guy, the town is going to go down and your, your town is just going to basically disintegrate. And it was just a, uh, you could feel the racism in the air. You know, you would go to the store and black, uh, white people would look at you or turn their heads. And, and this is in 2015, just a few years back. And so once uh, the election happened on April the 7th, and I did become the first black mayor of the village of Cahokia, I think it all came to a culmination at my board meetings and so my very first board meetings it would be mobs of i mean tons of people that would just be angry in my board meetings and be very disrespectful hateful i i couldn't talk i couldn't get meetings going without them screaming you cheated or get out of here n-word or you you we hate you and all of this and this is in 2015 you know just going back a couple years ago but I never, how I dealt with it was that I, I internalized it and I never really wanted to, I never, I always told myself that I'm not going to portray the stereotype or the images that have been put out towards black people through the media, which was the images of an angry black man, an image of someone who's just going against you or just coming out and, 
not being professional. And so I always wanted to just maintain a level of professionalism and courtesy at the same time, because I, my theory was that I could kill him with kindness. And I believe that eventually that happened, but I had one great role model and that role model was our former president, Barack Hussein Obama, because I studied Obama because it seemed like at the very time that I was going through what I was going through, he was going through what he was going through with the Senate and everything he was dealing with. And so I just kind of patterned my mannerisms after that. And eventually after a year or so, the meetings calmed down. And to this day, no one has, they've, they've accepted me for who I am as the mayor and not just looking at my skin tone. There it is. Beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> I call that like acceptance commitment. You just walk the walk. You just got to stand up to it and just keep going. And that's the type of leader that you've been. You, you have been amazing. <laughs> you have been amazing, sir. You really have. Um, what about you, Mayor Ricky Thomas? I think he may have been cut short. Or he might, okay. you know, okay. I think his connection may have been cut. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question and I will re-ask again, because this is pretty interesting. But Mayor now Banks. let's think about, Definitely. oh, Mayor Banks, please, Definitely. yes. Tell me, Mayor Banks, what, what about you, your first experience? Okay, so now you have to realize that uh, I'm 75. So when I was coming up, uh, Joe Lewis was a champion. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, you couldn't say that, you know, you go to the, to the grocery store and asked the butcher, you know, uh, uh, you singing Joe Lewis is the champion of the world and the white man say, what you say? And you say, if you ain't got rabbit, give me squirrel. <laughs> you know, so that's where, <laughs> that's when I came up. So I think my first uh, encounter was um, in 1956. We had, um, the reason I remember that so well is because we had, uh, a Mercury Montclair, and it had like a big Z on the side. And my parents took my uh, siblings and me to uh, Shaw, Mississippi, which is where they're, that's their home. And growing up in Brooklyn, everybody's black, you know, you weren't discriminated against. We um, were a pretty prominent family. So we, you know, we never were discriminated against because everybody was black. Nevertheless, we went to Shaw, Mississippi, and our parents let us go to the movie. And we didn't know anything about black and, and uh, colored and white water fountains. So my sister, who is a couple years older than I am, drank from the water fountain that said white only at this movie theater. We didn't know that <clears throat> the balcony was the best seat in the house. We didn't know that. But we had to sit in the balcony and the only water fountain was on the main floor. So my sister happened to drift downstairs away from the rest of us. It was like eight of us. And she drank from that water fountain. Well, she never came back to where we were. Mm -hmm. So we started looking for, come to find out the police had her at the police station. And they told my, they held us there at the police station in Shaw, Mississippi and told, had my older cousin walk back to her parents' house to get my parents to pick us up on the way out of town. And that's what they did. And, you know, uh, we never actually ever went back, but that was in 1956. And that was my first encounter of racism. But you have to realize, you know, I'm 75 and I was born and raised in an all black town. Wow. My, my most significant, oh, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. No, ma'am, uh, go ahead. No. Yeah. Well, my most significant encounter with racism, okay, I uh, had a job in uh, at the Boeing Company in Seattle, Washington, and I, my background is uh, power machine operator sewing. So I knew blueprints. And I was trying to get a job uh, as a inspector. Uh, they call it um, 
uh, um, well, inspection. Anyway, they didn't want to give me the job because I was black. Come to find out, it was during the same time when affirmative action came into existence. Well, little did people know that affirmative action wasn't for blacks. It was for white females who parents say their dads, you know, all of those old buildings that you see, you see those old Caucasian men. Well, all of them didn't have sons. So they wanted to put their daughters in charge on the board. So they came up with this affirmative action law to be able to put white people in place where they wouldn't ordinarily be able to go to because these big rich people that had these businesses didn't have sons to leave the business to. Anyway, they didn't want to give me the job. So my union rep came up with this affirmative action thing. And so I told him, you know, don't, don't give it to me because of the affirmative action. Give me the job because I deserve it. I have a college education. I know blueprint reading. And, you know, I can't see why you have to, I mean, let two of us get that position because I qualify. And I ended up, uh, when I retired from the Boeing Company, I was handing the keys to the pilot on the flight line. Yeah. <laughs> so it ended up with a good story. A good end. All right. What, what town did you grow Stephanie? up in? Excuse me? What town did you grow up in? I was born and raised in Brooklyn, but I grew up in Seattle, Washington. Okay. All right. Stay tuned. We got Joe Woolis' barber. He's still alive. He's 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 going to do an interview with us. Oh, okay. Yeah, all right. So let's let's move on. Yes. Stephanie, hi, this is Dee. I, I came up in Chicago in the Kenwood area, Kenwood Hyde Park area, walking distance from where um, the President Obama has his home. I was walking distance from him. I lived in one of the Hansberry buildings at one point in my life as a child. And actually, I didn't have enough sense to realize that I was being discriminated against probably <laughs> until I got uh, probably about 25. I worked... Um, Hmm. At, at, for Procter and Gamble, but I went. I lived in a segregated neighborhood where everyone looked out for you. You could go down the streets at night and or at afternoon, and you you knew who your neighbors were. When I went to high school, I went to Hyde Park High School, and we had a, a black vice principal named Emma Stacks who told me, and I, I worked for her in the office, and she told me, uh, you know, Debbie, uh, as long as you have a backbone and you stand up. You're going to make it. Don't let anything stop you. And I learned from that. I went to work for Procter and Gamble for ten years downtown, and I trained all the college students and all the uh, folks with with no melanin in their skin. I trained all of them in the jobs that they would not <laughs> let me have. Right. You know? Right. So wow. a lot of my time was spent, as Steve says, he was out there fighting. I was torturing them mentally by give, asking them questions that I knew they could not answer. <laughs> because, you know, uh, how do you do this paper? Then I would just sit back and spend my time waiting for them to come. <laughs> you know, I, I had customer service and, and, and shipping records. Uh, as I said, I was with them for 10 years. So when I went to work for them, we, you know, we had the commercials that Tide is better than Brand X and come to find out. Procter and Gamma made brand X also, but <laughs> I never let it stop me. Um, I can't really say that I really experienced it face to face mm -hmm. ra racism. Um, it was more just undercurrent that they would not let you have that promotion that they would, you know, I got the money, uh, I got recognition, but not on paper. So, so that was my thing. Uh, I've never really felt it because I've never accepted that I was less than anybody else. I, I started off in a parochial school, as I say, grew up in, in a segregated neighborhood and, and just went from there and worked my way through and raised my daughter. I, you want a fighter? Second generation. She, <laughs> oh, my daughter, if you, if you go back through the records of the Chicago Board of Education and their meetings, you will see Jatan Bird, uh, Jatan Bird Horn and just about everything that was fought for in the last 10, 15 years. So we don't, we don't take it. We, All right. we don't you take know, it. 
and see, this is this is one of the things, you guys, because this is like a living history right here. Because, you know, you guys haven't shared these stories with anyone except for maybe personal friends and family. So this is actually a living history that we're going through. And Francella, I would love to hear yours. I would love to hear your story as well. You and Lorenzo. Yes. First of all, let me let me thank you, but I was gonna pass because I know that you have a lot of questions. That you want to get to. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's only three rounds. It's only three questions, so this okay. is the first. Well, well, I was I was naive and didn't didn't really recognize racism until I got older. But I was the I was the black director on the campus of Southern Oil University, and when you are black faculty on a PWI, predominantly white university, the kids galvanize to you and and they come to you for support and and all that you become their parent away from home so continually mm -hmm. advocating for students on that campus they wanted Louis Farrakhan and I was the, mm -hmm. the program director with a big budget mm -hmm. did a contract with Louis Farrakhan the university said no he can't come on this campus so we had to take him mm -hmm. to East St. Louis just different things like that but after about three four years I think they got tired of me as the only black director in, in student affairs and so I got called in the office one day of personnel they said that I was being laid off because of budgetary reductions mm -hmm. at the same time they were hiring a lot of other people in student affairs and one of my mentors at the university Ms. Donna Gunter you should sue like I did they're, 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 this is a racist university discriminating I'm, I just I, I didn't sue number one I didn't have money to hire a lawyer I was just out of a All job right. and then <laughs> um, and then you I made it. I made it through. But now, I recognize it as soon as I see it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we'll call it out. We'll continue to call it out. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Right. Thank you for sharing, <laughs> Lorenzo. Did you want to uh, give us give us um? What you give us your time? I'll give you one quickly. I uh, I can't compare to those. Okay. <laughs> I to the one from Brooklyn, the mayor. I mean, um, you know, man, thank you, thank you for going through what she went through and for us. And what I was uh, the earliest I remember was in Granite City. I think I was like seven years old, and my mom she liked to shop at Glick. You know, I don't know if you guys remember Glick, and she would put our stuff on layaway. You know, in June. <laughs> And then we'd go up there in August, September. So we were walking in Granite City. And uh, me and my little brother, my older brother and my little sister were walking with her. And they, you know, some some European Americans, <laughs> you know, called out, <laughs> nigga, go home, you know. And I was about to say something, because I'm from East St. Louis. But my mom was <laughs> from Eagle Point. She's from Madison. She's from that area. And she's right. like, keep walking. She said, like, keep walking. Don't say nothing. And, you know, the feeling, and this was in the 80s, man, and it, it still hurts to this day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. And that's, abs that's absolutely, you know, with us being in that same generation, that was mine too. My mother, when I heard it and was called out of my name, she snatched me. I wasn't even allowed to respond or show any emotion, you know? She was like, is that who you are? And I said, no. And she goes, well, then they're not talking to you. Keep going. Yeah, we wouldn't have made it home, you know? Right. I mean, and just like with the mayor, you know, her sister, her cousin or something could have been another Emmett Till. And how many of them do we know that happened that we don't know about? Absolutely. Right. So again, as we move on to this walk, I'm going to speed it up some now. You know, we're thinking about this narrative in Juneteenth. Jim Crow, we've heard the words marginalization even throw come out, you know, and um, the 13th Amendment, you know, uh, Jim Crow laws were a collection of state and local statutes that legalized racism, racial segregation. It was named after a black minstrel show character. The laws which existed for about a hundred years from the post-Civil War era until 1968, were meant to marginalize African-Americans by denying them the right to vote, hold jobs, get an education, you name the opportunity, we were, they found a way to strategically cut us off of it. And if you attempted to defy Jim Crow laws, 
you are often faced with things like we've talked about today, arrest, fines, jail sentences, violence, death, things like that, okay? So let's just take a look again. I'm going to refer back to some slides here. We've got another verse here from our president, Abraham Lincoln. Mr. Taylor, you want to read that? Uh, I was, I had this great vision uh, because I love the way our senator reads. Absolutely. And he also, I, thought, okay. <laughs> I had a great Bell, vision if, if, if Senator could play uh, Abraham Lincoln for us today here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're on mute. You're on mute, Senator. Terrence, you get me every time. <laughs> <laughs> but but with, with the screen being the way okay. that it is, I can't see. Uh, okay. I got you. I got you, Dan. I got you. All right. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hollow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we take a look here at the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. It was ratified in 1865 in the aftermath of the Civil War, abolished slavery in the United States, the 13th Amendment states, neither slave nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, wherefore the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their juris jurisdiction. So now we're thinking about that reconstruction period, because remember, we're taking a walk. So your next question is coming up. You know, that reconstruction, you know, these two sides, they had to find a way to get together and pull back together policies, all the things that we saw getting done now after each election, kind of, you know, but they also wanted to find a way to box up would have been done during slavery into some kind of neat little package um, and, and create their own narrative. But no matter what narrative they were putting out, every year <laughs> in honor annually of our African-American Freedom Day, we would come out and we would keep the fires of hope burning to continue the great work begun by President Lincoln. All men are created equal. And I know that um, our NJLF president has a lot to say, but please hold it, sir, because when it comes to you, you can, you can open it up with both barrels. <laughs> so now we ask ourselves, you know, we see Trayvon. We see the survivor of the people's store. We have Miss Opal here who is 93. And she says at 93, I don't want my walk to be in vain. She's been going across the United States raising awareness for Juneteenth and signing this petition. It's very important that we continue to open uh, up discussions about past yeah, laws. Sorry, Steph. Do we know how many miles Miss Opal has walked so far? Uh, we don't have a tally on it, but she walks two and a half miles at each one of her sites to represent the two and a half years between the um, commencement of the Emancipation Proclamation and the arrival of the U.S. Colored Troops in Galveston. Hmm. So with that in mind, you go ahead and be the first one to answer 
what comes to mind? How important is Juneteenth to an equitable future? Oh, me? Yes, sir. Oh. Uh, <laughs> the importance of Juneteenth, Juneteenth brings balance, you know, to the America's freedom celebrations. Uh, I have to say this, Doc Myers was my mentor. More than that, he was my sensei. If, if any of you who understand martial arts know the difference between a teacher, a mentor, and a sensei, you know whenever you can have a sensei who will go to war with you and, and, and bring you into it, that's what Doc was. And so um, this discussion was ingrained into me about the importance of Juneteenth for America, okay? Understand, us as Juneteenthers, we don't need the holiday. It was already a day off for me. It was already as commemoration for us, okay? The, 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 the holiday of Juneteenth is for America to make it live up to its creed. It brings balance to the, cel to, to, to the celebrations. Um, Doc's be best saying was, the 4th of July freed the land, Juneteenth freed the people. Amen. All the people, because in order for you to keep somebody in slavery, to keep them down, you've got to be tied to that, okay? <laughs> um, Juneteenth completes the cycle of freedom celebrations for America, okay? We have to acknowledge that, and America has to acknowledge that, and that is the awareness, the awareness of the ending of Chateau slavery, and understand this, people, everybody, especially us, our people, Understand it's the end of chateau slavery and the beginning of our pursuit of liberty. Okay? The one thing which cannot be legislated is the beginning of our pursuit of liberty. And every time that you see someone successful from the beginning, it is always about liberty. Okay? It is always about liberty. The first writing about us by us, Lemuel Haynes, it was called an extension of liberty. He wrote it at the same time they were writing the constitution. And he talked about the liberty more than freedom. So we have to be able to get there. My favorite saying when it comes to acknowledging the importance of Juneteenth is the guy who got it started in the, in the 20th century, A. Philip Randolph. The Poor People's March was organized on Juneteenth, 1968. And he said, there is no reserve seat at the banquet table of nature. The key Juneteenth mentality. So the importance of it being instilled into the American psyche is vitally important for it to be recognized as a day of observance, for them to take time out and to execute certain things to bring acknowledgement to Juneteenth. It is vital, it is essential. Juneteenth is core on everything. And I would just like to let you know that behind the scenes, while you hear all this public uproar about everything going on in the government, we, the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation, have been contacted by the left, the right, and the middle about That's what right. can we do about Juneteenth and how can mm -hmm. we get it overboard, okay, on board. So let you know it's going to happen. We just have to make sure we have control over how it happens. Absolutely, sir. Okay, yeah. so I'm going to go straight to Senator Belt. How important is Juneteenth and equity? Um, uh, again, to echo to some of the uh, sentiments of uh, Mr. Williams, it's it's important because it's, it's it underscores it acknowledges uh, the wrongs done to uh, a people. Right? If America fought for independence, to get freedom from the, the British, uh, the tyranny of the British, then surely America should celebrate uh, being free from uh, slavery, putting an end to slavery. Uh, and so it's huge for equity because it acknowledges, you, you, you cannot heal, you cannot move forward, you cannot uh, do anything unless there's acknowledgement and, and, and having Juneteenth, right, would be an acknowledgement of, of past wrongs done uh, to, to, to people of African descent in this country. From there, you can start talk, moving forward about equity, having that real conversation, because at the end of the day, equity right. is, 
equity really is about, it's not about fairness. A lot of people use those words as, as, as uh, synonymous, synonyms, you know, it's not about fairness. You know, equity, there's a difference between equity and equality. Equality says you give everybody the same thing. Equity say, says you give me what I deserve. And so, and so when we start having that discussion about equity, I, I, I say it in the Senate and I'll, I'll say it to anyone who will listen, some of the issues that we face today are based off fairness. And when people hear you talk about, you know, give me this or this is ours or we deserve this, they, they base it off fairness. And you cannot even begin to have a discussion about fairness until we reach equity. And then once we reach equity, we go forward and, and, and we, can, we can be fair. Uh, there are some instances where uh, we're, 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 we're demanding that, you know, you, you get two balls and we get four, right? That's not fair, but that's equity, you know, because we have to catch <laughs> And so, and so <laughs> right. to your point uh, about equity, you know, we, we were fighting for it in the, in the, in the uh, Illinois legislature. The Black Caucus have been moving uh, equity pieces and in, in, in trying to get uh, a, a more equitable society for, for, for all people in Illinois, all people be inclusive. And so to come full circle again, I think it's important. You have to have acknowledgement. You have to atone for what's been done. And I think the acknowledgement and, and a full day, as Mr. As Mr. Williams said, we black folk already celebrate uh, uh, Juneteenth. They take off whether it's scheduled or not, but, you know, and, and, and so they do that. But the United States need to understand that, that, that they need to give this grant this day. They need to say, okay, it's a national holiday. And we recognize, uh, again, in, in, in theory, the ending of uh, the abolishment of uh, slavery uh, to a people based off color. So that's my take on it. Thank you, State Representative Greenwood. How important is Juneteenth to equity? It's very important. It's everything that the other speakers have said. I don't like to be redundant, but it's about rededicating and re-educating ourselves in um, the fight for, I'm happy Senator Bell really broke down that difference yeah. between equity and equality, mm -hmm. because like he said, the words are thrown around and some people don't really understand the meaning. So that's all I have to say. I thought the previous speaker summed it up well absolutely thank you um let's see here what about um mayor mccall what do you think sir yes ma'am you know i'm just i'll be brief i just think that uh you know juneteenth juneteenth is equitable for the future because it advances uh that core premise of one nation under god indivisible with liberty and justice for all uh, because it's not just black history, this is world history. That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. And then now we I'm going to skip. Wait, wait, yeah. wait. We got Mayor Banks, and she, yes. will be, she will be, Mayor Banks is going to be uh, issuing a proclamation to us this year. So, uh, Mayor Banks. We were going to leave that for the last round for all the good stuff. Oh, okay. After we're going through this difficult time, <laughs> we're going to end up on top on the positive. So the so the state rep and the senator they're about to go ham on all the good things happening here. Real soon. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mayor, so yes, hear? I would like to hear Mayor Banks's response. Oh, as and far then as I would like to give our queen a chance an opportunity to answer one of these questions and she will be included in the last round as well. So how do you think, what do you think about equity and Juneteenth? How important are those two items? Well, uh, I, in my estimation, equity is like um, stakeholder ownership being a part of. And most of the time, if you have a vested interest then you're, you're dedicated. It, it's more uh, about you and about us. 
on Juneteenth is like a, a day of freedom when the shackles were, you know, taken off. And, and I own this, you know, th uh, this is me, this is who I am. And just like I would celebrate my birthday and mm -hmm. Christmas and Easter, and, you know, we even uh, have a, a tooth fairy. I'm gonna make it a decoration in Brooklyn where June 19th, will be declared a holiday for, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, hey, Juneteenth. Absolutely. Your All things Juneteenth. <laughs> All things Juneteenth. <laughs> Absolutely. All things Juneteenth. And we, and we got Lorenzo Savage as well. So we want to make sure that Lorenzo uh, brings the voice of the magazine as well. So, so Mr. Savage, can you answer that question briefly, please, sir? I put you up there and answer that. Well, I tell you what, I think every day is uh, Black History Day, first of all. And Juneteenth is another opportunity for people to recognize the, 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 the struggles that we have overcome in spite of everything, all the pitfalls that have been put in our place that we've overcome. You know, when, when we were slaves, Europeans were given hundreds of acres of land for free. And, and so the generational wealth issue cannot be solved without a redistribution of wealth. We have to say that and we have to say reparations. I don't hear a lot of people saying reparations. I've been pushing it out there. And <laughs> so I might be wrong, but uh, the mm -hmm. Indians got reparations, the Japanese Americans got reparations. Why the slaves can't get reparations? Is the check too big? Tell me. Not for me. Okay, um, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna move on to the last set of slides and the last questions, and that will give everyone that opportunity to give some final thoughts as well as some uplifting views, okay? I have to stay in front of my triangle there or else my teeth won't be right. <laughs> All right, that's just a side note in case anybody was <laughs> curious, okay. Here's our last round. <laughs> All right, eight minutes and 46 seconds. George Floyd Jr. was an African-American man killed during an arrest after a store clerk alleged he had passed a counterfeit $20 bill in Minnesota. Derek Chauvin, one of the four police officers who arrived on the scene knelt on Floyd's neck for a period initially reported to be eight minutes and 46 seconds. Listen to these words, please. I just want to be free. Same as God, I can't believe. Rest in peace, George Floyd. To be equal. Trying to let you know that I can't breathe. Somebody to help me. Trying to let you know that I can't Breathe. I got the weight of the world on the back of my neck. How is it that I'm on this ground? Can't nobody hear me. Acting like they don't see me. Don't nobody care about me. Now I'm gasping for air. I feel the wind leaving my soul. Situations out of control. Somebody help me. I'm trying to let you know that I can't breathe. Whoa, send somebody to help me. I'm trying to let you know that I can't breathe. I got the weight of the world on the back of my neck. 
See, I woke up today, thought it was gonna be a good day, but anything can go wrong when you wearing dark brown skin. Now I'm feeling so abused, wrong place at the wrong time. I know my life is on the line, and I'm not gonna make it. Trying to let you know that I can't breathe. Send somebody to help me. I said I'm trying to let the whole world know that I can't breathe. I got the weight of the ball on the back of my neck. Can you hear me? So I don't understand. Why is this to a good black man? Oh, gotta be a good reason. Am I the sacrifice? I've been chosen for this bitch. And I'm crying, Mama, Mama. Why are they doing this? It's not supposed to end like this. They can't get away with this. Oh, I believe that's what he was saying. So we gotta tell the story. Oh, I can't breathe. Happy June team. So, um. That song by an East St. Louis resident, you know, I couldn't hold it together the day he actually sang it. But again, I just, I, I need us to take this walk. You know, we've gone from, we shall overcome. There's been so many different sections and different times in our lives when we've had to just continue to persevere and just keep things moving, you know, so, we're at such a pivotal point to where now we've gone from we shall to where we're crying, Black Lives Matter, damn it. We're looking for equity. We want inclusion. We want you to quit trying to put history under the rug. We want you to bring to light the laws that were being addressed that continue to need, need changing and updating. I, I'm not crying today because today is Valentine's Day and it is about where we're going and we are happy about where we're going. People have been on the battlefield on this mission for so many years so many years and I thank everyone who continues to be a soldier in this fight so to leave us on a happy note because we are yelling that we need a change who's been willing to go out on a limb to get to the fruit of the tree we have our state representative and our beloved Senator on the call who have spent time working in sessions to come up with things that, that look at our criminal justice reform. And I don't wanna stumble over my words with nomenclature. So I'm gonna turn it over to State Representative uh, Greenwood and Senator Belt to please tell us as we look to our future what kind of things are you looking at to address the roadblocks that's been in the way for so long? Is that a big question? But I know you got <laughs> Um Well, we can start by just talking about, we are both members of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus. Yay. So, <laughs> You talked about George Floyd and when um, he was murdered, the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus really set out to deal with issues of systemic racism in our state. 
and develop four pillars, which include criminal justice reform, which is um, health care reform, education, and economic reform, and which Senator Belt is the lead sponsor on the economic reform package, which okay. did pass during Lane Duck session. All right. <laughs> so we have three pieces of very important legislation that is on the governor's desk right now for him to sign to begin to address issues that are still happening and occurring in 2021 in the state of Illinois. And we know that it is through policy that we begin to impact communities like East St. Louis, Brooklyn, Cahokia, and all of the surrounding municipal Washington Park and all of the surrounding municipalities that we represent collectively. And so um, we hear a lot about the criminal justice reform bill because that is the bill that has just been met with the most resistance. Mm -hmm. And people resist when it's time to change. And, um, and I'll turn it over to Senator Bell to throw in some words. And I think, you know, I think kind of Toya, it's like Latoya, Miss Greenwood, state rep. It's like, um, <laughs> you know, people people really don't have an understanding, you know, when it comes to that criminal reform bill. I know, you know, you're talking about cash bail. So people are like, they want to take the, the you know, the, the ultimate thing, which is, okay, somebody gets, you know, called for murder and, you know, now they don't have bail. So they'll just be out on the street, you know, uh, things of that sort uh, are people yeah, are looking people, at or like. Right, people <laughs> take extreme examples and create a false narrative. So I think we've been um, really pushing out the facts about House Bill 3653, myself and Senator Bell, through um, information and discussions just like this on the piece of legislation. So um, it's not about defunding police, it's not anti-police, it's none of that. It's about correcting policies that have impacted in particular black and brown people in our state in unjustly. And it's about correcting those things. Yeah. Absolutely. Senator Bell? I would concur wholeheartedly with uh, Representative Greenwood, the, the, the criminal justice piece is the lightning rod. Let me tell you this about the criminal justice piece. Uh, it, it is it's a deliberate and intentional narrative put out there to undermine what was done uh, with that legislation. You, you, you don't rush. There's not a knee jerk reaction. There's no rushing when you have nine subject matter hearings, bipartisan nine subject matter hearings and over 30 hours of uh, testimony. That just doesn't even <clears throat> uh, equate to rushed, you know? And again, it was bipartisan. It was, it, we brought in the experts and, you know, to just, just to save time on, on that discussion. Uh, there's nothing, and I've shared, I've shared a lot of the legislation with people on this call. Uh, and there's nothing nothing that funds the police. There's nothing that dissolves the police. There's nothing uh, that, that, that does anything that makes them any safer because at the end of the day, we support our police. But the, 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 the argument is that you, you, you can't support both. You can't support reform and support the police. And that's just not true. You, you should be able to support both. Right. And, and, and if you look and, 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 and as the kids would say, I double dog dare you to look at that legislation. <laughs> then come back to us and tell us where, where, where that legislation is anti-police. It's not in there. What it is though, it requires transparency. It requires accountability. If, if someone dies while they're in police custody, then the AG's office comes in to investigate that. If you die while you're in police custody, you shouldn't have a problem with having an attorney's general general's office come in and investigate the murder or, or the death of, of someone in, in police cover. That shouldn't even be an issue. 
And so if you look across the board at what this this legislation is about, not just in the criminal justice pillar, you're gonna you're gonna hear stuff in education as well. That's what we want to hear too, education sir. Is <laughs> out there and tell the whole story, not just the story of the victor. Tell the whole story, and 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 tell the stories of of, of black people in the country. Don't gloss over slavery. Talk about it. And, and, and then tell our accomplishments in, 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 in totality. Let's not just wait to February and, and, and give me Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, and, and, and Martin Luther Amen, Luther. amen. And so, and so that's gonna come up. And so, and, and, and then the, the, the issue with uh, uh, the, the healthcare, one of the things that COVID exposed is what we've already known, that there is a disparity in healthcare quality education that exists between the haves and the have nots. And it should not be that way. Your zip code should not determine uh, your, your healthcare or, or your, your education. Nowhere in the Illinois state constitution does it say that education should be funded off property tax. I, I, I looked it over, I, I'm, I looked it up and down. It doesn't, it, education should not be funded by property tax. Hmm. But it is. And so that that sets up the haves versus the have nots. Mm -hmm. Right. You have million dollar homes. You have affluent neighborhoods. You're going to have better school districts. Mm -hmm. But in the Illinois state constitution under the, the, the section of education, there's nothing that says it's supposed to be funded by property tax. Mm -hmm. It says quality education should be given for free public schooling but it comes from the, the, the state, it doesn't do that. And so what we're looking for uh, is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a point of inflection that says, okay, let's, let's the, the whole conversation has been about equity. Let's set the bar, let's make it even, let's have these discussions and understand there's a cost to leadership. You know, you, whenever you, you agitate, Frederick Douglass said the, the, the precursor to change is agitation. And so whenever you agitate, Right, you 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 you're gonna get some resistance, and it's gonna and, it, and it, it's not often cute, and it's not often pretty. Uh, I had 600 emails over that criminal justice vote I took. Wow! It, it was wow! wow. Representative Greenwood had about four or five hundred, and wow. so they were threatening and menacing and this, that, and the other, all because mm. we voted for detainees' rights and to free uh, uh, to end cash bail. Now, to to Terrence's point. When we when we set forth to end um, cash bail, we're not looking to let people all murderers and rapists on the street because because that's what you hear. Mm -hmm. No, there's going to be an assessment tool put in place, and those that are if you're a flight risk or the offense is 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 bad enough, you don't even you're not even getting released. Mm -hmm. And it puts the discretion back to the judges that say, okay, if this it, there's going to be an assessment tool. And you're just not going to be willy nilly free. You're going to have to go to pretrial. You're going to have to see probation officers while you wait for your court date. But what that does is it doesn't keep you locked up. It doesn't make you lose a job that you have. And, and so you're able to hold on to your job. You're able to go look at jobs. You're able to be with your family. The, the, the system, the way that it stands now is, is biased. Uh, socioeconomic uh, issues. You can be a poor white person and suffer from uh, mm -hmm. cash bail. It ain't, it has a black face, but it, this is across the board uh, mm -hmm. uh, good policy for Illinois, and I'll leave it at that. And I, I, I think I heard you say a lot about uh, education. Was there, you know, last I heard you were vice chairman of the education committee in the state of Illinois. So is there any updates on that particular uh, process? I'm uh, I'm the chairman now. He's the chair. So some congratulations in order, huh? <laughs> yeah, so, and, and, and he, so, now, if there ain't no other chair in the room, <laughs> his chair is there. Yeah, I'm the chair <laughs> and, 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 and Representative <laughs> Greenbelt is also chair over, over health over in the house. And yeah. so, uh, look, it's, it's, it's about being inclusive in the process. You know, you, again, we, we, we talk about inclusiveness and you think about black folk, but when, when you go through that door, just in, the, in, in terms of civil rights movements, when blacks go through the door, brown 
Latinx communities do well. Everyone comes because it's all inclusive. When you when the 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 um the pillar I pushed, I, I sponsored. Look, we voted on a forty-five billion dollar uh, capital bill uh, two May's ago, last year in May. Forty-five billion. We're asking the state in the areas of procurement and spending in universities and state agencies spend twenty percent on diversity. Twenty percent of forty-five billion is nine billion dollars. That's transformational money. Yeah. If, 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 if Terrence, if I could give you a trucking company, if you have a trucking company and I'm spending some of that money towards your business, what are you going to do? You're going to hire more black people in your business. Latin Absolutely. people are going to hire more Latin people in that business. Women are going to hire pe persons with disabilities, <laughs> minorities. If you fall under that class of uh, that protected class, you, you're you in that 20 percent. But what they're telling us is you we can't find enough. I think the best they've had, the best they've had is 13%. That's 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 unacceptable. Right. It's unacceptable. You we're still leaving 36 billion with a B on the table. But we what we're saying is those 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 populations that are, are, are hard to find that traditionally haven't been included at the table, we're policymakers. We're saying 20% find them hire them, spend money with them, right? That changes lives, that changes trajectories. And that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. That's Empowerment. Just, you know, that should be, it's about the dollars, the speed. Yeah. It's our tax dollars anyway, it's everybody's tax dollars. And I think that was, I think that's awesome, you know, uh, Chris, because you guys, you and uh, Mrs. Greenwood, you guys have always been on the forefront of uh, some of this new legislation. And, and what it, what has really impressed me, actually um, impressed me was how much legislation that you guys are doing. You know, the, your predecessors, I mean, they weren't doing, I mean, a 10th as much and passing a 10th as many bills as you guys have passed and they were there. You know, you, Chris, your, your your predecessor was there for almost okay. what, 10, 20 years. But yeah, but but then I was just saying that and I was going into the education piece. No, and Latoya's as well. But I was going into um, the education piece because as uh, the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation, we do have a Juneteenth curriculum. And we'd like to see that Juneteenth curriculum in every school across the country. Uh, so that's one of the things that, you know, we wanted you guys to be aware of that, that we'll be pushing for the Juneteenth curriculum in the schools in Illinois. So just be prepared for, you know, the things that we put forth in that regard. And so with that, why don't we um, get to understand maybe what some of the pillars of the caucus are, and then we can have, um, our president of NJOF and um, D, our communications, go over what our pillars are and our education piece as well, real quick. Okay, uh, the pillars for the Black Caucus are education, criminal justice reform, economic opportunity, and healthcare, access to healthcare. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, and Mr. Williams? Well, well you want to talk? we don't really have pillars because of where we're at. Um, what we have is an understanding and it's based upon biblical understanding. And that is um, a scripture that stands out to us all that we need to apply to everything that we do. And that is to study, to show thyself approved, a workman unto God, who need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We have to do that with our history from the very beginning, and that's our pillar. We go out and we find out everything, whether we like it or not, we assemble together. And I'm so grateful for the education staff. Some of them are on the team today. Dr. Sade cast, Dr. Sade Turnipseed, um, yes. created the Juneteenth 101 document. 
We yes. put things in our perspective, our light. We allow the educators, we allow the authors, we allow the historians, the museum curators to function with complete autonomy and the ability to put together our information. We started out just about studying about Juneteenth and we have extended it to, you know, um, our history um, from, from Mother Africa to this present day. So that's what we're about. We're doing in the segments. I appreciate so many of them or what we're doing and what they assemble. It's truly amazing. And Mr. Williams, um, briefly, what about our um, work here lately to try to connect youth to the internet? I'm sure Senator Belt would love to hear that. One of the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation's um, initiatives nationwide is bridging the digital divide. Besides being with the Juneteenth board, I'm also a member of the Internet Society, ISOC, and they're putting me on the International Board of Directors. We go around and we help establish community networks to bridge the digital divide in our areas. We've got networks in Baltimore, uh, we're in, in Las Vegas, uh, we're developing networks in Galveston, Texas, and we come to East St. Louis and Mississippi. The, rural, the digital divide isn't just only about access to the internet, right? It's also understanding how it operates. So with these places, we put in a very established, very proven program by the Raspberry Pi Academy called Coder Dojos, which, teach, which is teaching young people all over the world about how the technology to make the internet run and how it operates. My call to them was, and when I looked at it, guess who wasn't involved? Guess who wasn't on the ground level? Guess who I did not see any of throughout the whole world? Us. And we're going to put it right there by um, our offices on 4601 and then have it expand from out there too. Sorry, so Steve, go ahead. <laughs> we teach the young, our youth about how the internet operates and we make it available so that business owners and operators can understand how to leverage technology through everything from payroll and inventory management to advertising to e-commerce. The whole program has been rolling out and we started like that. Very successful in Baltimore, which is a, which is a really tough place. We've got four sites in Baltimore that we're doing right now. So and I, also, I also with the more. education, um, Steve, too, um, we do have some, some pilot curriculum as well that we do want to uh, maybe go into some conversations. We know we can't change the whole state of curriculum, but we would like to inject some proper information and some things that are not known. Is that not correct? Right. Our foundation right here, we have three books written by members of our foundation. Juneteenth, the Celebration of Freedom by Dr. Charles Taylor. The Trials of Nance, which is right there in your neighborhood, written by Carl Adams. And he's Juneteenth. under a parking lot, y'all. We got to get him. <laughs> yeah, the, the, um, of Nance, I'm um, Leggins Costley. And then Juneteenth, the Children's Story, written by Opal Lee. Um, we also have Juneteenth, the one-on-one -on -one document teaching guide is developed with that. And we have Juneteenth Awareness um, Project that we have. Our full-fledged curriculum is being developed right now. Um, we we um, are working with uh, some very prominent doctors, um, Dr. Um, Little Spigner out of Oklahoma, um, Dr. Turnipsey, Dr. Taylor, um, we have a lot of people working to put this together in a real way. So we have things to get out. The education is really important. I just have to say that because we have been subversively indoctrinated in America. You can call it Jim Crow or whatever it is, but the education system is really about subversive indoctrination. We don't get the understanding. We don't get the truth. I just take 30 seconds. For example, we all learned about Christmas Addicts. Christmas Addicts took a bullet and died for America. Okay, the story wasn't completely true. But the greater story is Peter Salem, the hero of the Battle of Bunker Hill. Peter Salem stood up in the middle of the Battle of Bunker Hill, shot the British commander in the head, and told the rest of the 13 officers how to fight and get down the hill. And they wrote letters of commendation to George Washington about this man. We don't hear about him because that means he died of old age. We can win. We don't have to die for America. That's an example of subversive indoctrination. 
It goes on. One more example. We hear about Nate Turner and the rebellion of Nate Turner. Nate Turner had a rebellion. He was caught and hung. But you will never hear about Juan Caballo, John Horse, who led the only successful slave rebellion in the second, in the um, in the Second Seminole War. He forced America to capitulate, and all the slaves of here in Florida were set free. He became known as the Moses of Oklahoma, and set up the Muscogos in, in Mexico after America reneged on his promises. You won't hear about that because guess what? John Horace won the subversive indoctrination. There's a whole many of examples of that and the education committee is pulling the covers off it, off it all. Okay, very, very good. Now, as we close out, <clears throat> let me get this up here. Okay, Mr. Taylor, you wanna read this one? Okay. This is the last verse of the Gettysburg Address. Okay. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Absolutely. Ms. D, do you want to talk about the petition, ma'am? Uh, yes, I will. I can do that. Ms. Opal has been doing this since 2016. She took 1.5 million petitions to Congress at the end of September. She, we are seeking another 1.5 to go at the end of this month. Um, she is, she is, as you say, is, she's 94 years old and she hasn't stopped. And last June, she led a caravan of about a hundred cars while she walked in front of them for the two and a half miles to bring attention to Juneteenth and the legislation. We are seeking at least the observation of a, a, a national observation of Juneteenth, not necessarily a state holiday. We, we will go with a state, Juneteenth observance uh, in all 50 states. Right now we have 49 state bills. We do wanna go with a national legislation. Uh, hopefully it will be back in Congress uh, by the end of this month. We need your support. We need you to get all uh, your mailing list to tell people to go to Juneteenth.us and sign the petition, P tell your friends to sign the petition, put it on your websites and pass the word that we want Juneteenth recognized because it does complete the cycle of freedom in this country. All right, Dean. Now, uh, just to make it um, perfectly clear, are you stating that we have 1.5 million signatures at this current time? Our organization, uh, Ms. Ms. Uh, Opal's group, has has obtained at this point we're at about almost 1.7 I believe we we right. we're, we have not stopped taking petitions and it is our <laughs> understanding that there are other organizations that, that have uh, petitions out there that could contribute another 800,000 signatures to mm -hmm. that thought that we want Juneteenth recognized so if we can all team together and, and Juneteenth is a group uh, uh, activity. We're, we, we would be over 2 million signatures of folks that want to see Juneteenth come to the forefront and take its proper place in this, uh, in this history of our country, because we have been here from the, from the beginning. As Steve says, Revolutionary War, we were there. We have been involved in every war. We invented everything because we were the ones doing the work. Hello. So we, you know, we, we don't have the recognition because we could not write. They did not allow us to read or write. And so we didn't get the trademarks, but we did invent the things that had to be done. We helped build Washington, D.C. We are still building this country. We want to get Juneteenth out there. We want to get the education. We want to uncover the stories that they have hidden that you don't know about. Um, I mean, we, we recognize June 19th, 1865, but that really wasn't the end of slavery in this country. The... Um, the Native Americans had slaves in the Western territories for at least another year. It was in June of 1866 before you had the, the treaties with the five uh, so-called uh, uh, nations, the nations of, uh, oh, 
Steve, you better jump in and help me. Five Indian nations. The, 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 thank five, you, thank the, five, the five so-called civilized. Civilized, yeah. civilized nations. That's, that's the word I'm looking five for. Thank you. civilized tribes, the Creek, the um, Chococal, the Chickasaw, the Cherokee, and the Seminole. Well, that's, that's right. one. So a nation is comprised of its states and its territories. So in the complete story of Juneteenth, on June 19, 1862, America abolished slavery in the territories. It was part of Abraham Lincoln's progressive legislation to end, end slavery in America. And it was not finalized until the Treaty of 1866 on June 14, 1866. So, um, and those freedmen went on to found 100 black towns in the area, of which yeah. we had 66 in Oklahoma and 12, I believe 12 or 13 are still in existence. One of those 100 towns was Tulsa. Eight, 89 black towns in Oklahoma, 13 are still in existence. Edward P. McCabe used some of the events that you talked about earlier, Stephanie, to encourage, and that's what they're talking about, tell them to go west. They were telling them to go west at that time because black people were establishing independent towns and attempting to make Oklahoma a black state. So those freedmen, freedmen, and those formerly enslaved were all converging upon Oklahoma and building an economy and building a life in a society for themselves. All right. Now so we got is about our 10 national more minutes. queen on the call? There you go. Do, do, do you have any statements for us uh, that we can get from our queen? And then from that, um, Sylvia, I would ask you to give us some thoughts on the pageant again, please. Scholarship program. Yeah, this pageant scholarship program. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> It's so new and exciting. Uh, Sanaya, are you on the call? Hi, Sanaya. You know, Help. it took those women wow. planned for two years. So, you know, it took a lot of work and, and dedication and, and 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 effort to make sure that this took off and I appreciate them for it. We want Absolutely. to thank all of all of our coordinators, especially Miss Sylvia Harris, who I believe is on the phone with us. Uh, and she's, she's working as our national coordinator this year. So we want to give our props and our thank you to Sylvia. And Ms. Sanaya, thank you for everything that you're doing. Move forward, my friend. Go ahead, Sanaya. What was the question? I was just asking you, when you think about Juneteenth, our freedom and mm -hmm. Black history, did you mm -hmm. have a statement you would like to give us? Well, Juneteenth means to me that we are free and that we are leaders. Juneteenth allows me to imagine how hard it has been for our ancestors and to acknowledge any feelings of freedom that it took them to get to where they are. Absolutely, absolutely. And what's the name of the college you've just been accepted to? Delaware State University. Mm -hmm. That is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and we just heard from Steve. Is there any final words um, from you and Ms. Evans? Yeah, um, you know, I want to tell everyone that understanding our history and knowing the history is essential for America to come to terms with itself, okay? Black History Month was created in February by us, by Dr. Robert Starling Pritchard, who understood the importance of understanding, who understood the importance of us knowing who we are and our contribution to America. He chose February because of what it means classically, historically. February, the word means purification. February adds balance to all things, including time. That's why it's a flex month on on, on with 29 days and wow. keep everything in order. And Dr. Starling's mentioned for us to understand and appreciate black people and our history in America will help purify America and bring it back to where it was at. We set the first Black History Month. We set the first month at any time. Nobody had anything behind it. And Dr. Starling's inspiration was not only Black History Week, but the Juneteenth celebrations which he participated in. So with the Pan American Pan African Institute, he decided to bring the focus upon that and was mm -hmm. a staunch supporter of Juneteenth uh, and Doc Myers. Um, we want to let everybody know that the things that you can do right now, sign the petition 
as on the front, stay in touch with the National Juneteenth Observance Foundation. Send an email to join at nationaljuneteenth.org. Put your name in the subject line. You'll find out everything else that you need to from that particular communication, <laughs> including who and where we have to new, move to get the national agenda met. So Absolutely. look forward to you all. Um, I'm celebrating this year uh, the, the legal observance of Juneteenth in one form or a matter, in one form or another. And um, we thank you for your support. All right, Ms. Evans, did you have any final words? I'd like to see that everyone gets a, we have a flag, that, that flag that you see uh, on the screen right now, that is the authorized Juneteenth flag. It is <laughs> only available through our organization. We would like to see that flag flown over all of the state houses, all of the, the post offices or wherever you can fly. You can get you a, a small copy for yourself. We have golf size 14 by 20, put them on your car, put them in your window, flag, uh, do a caravan. If you, the flag raising is the least expensive thing that you can do. If we still have COVID, you do a caravan on Juneteenth. You take the flag through the community and, and let people know that we are here. Uh, in Chicago, I know the Puerto Ricans have their flags hanging out of car windows on the same, at the same time period. Let's meet them out there in the street. Let's show our flag. Let's show our pride. And, and make sure you share the education. We've got to get our history out there. We are the survivors. We are the winners. We are the warriors. Do, do what you have to do, but share the message of Juneteenth. Share the message of freedom. Thank you, and hope to see you on our call on Saturdays. Once again, sign the petition, Juneteenth.us. Absolutely, and you can really check out Ms. D as well and the wonderful things she's doing on the NJLF level there in Las Vegas. It's a beautiful flower that is sprouting, and last year, I think her numbers just were overwhelming. So kudos to all that you do in your neck of the woods, and kudos to what you do for us nationally. Thank, Thank you to you, you both. And lastly, and lastly, but not least, <laughs> I'm Sylvia and I'll speak to the, the uh, National Miss Juneteenth Scholarship Program. Please uh, do. We are uh, giving young women the opportunity um, to showcase their talent, their, their um, intelligence. We're giving, we're empowering them uh, and we are in the process of putting this together for the, the country. We are including all the states and we're asking everyone to participate. We are also, um, it is a scholarship program. So we are fundraising to um, raise enough money in order to give the young ladies the scholarships that they compete to win. So if you're interested in donating, check in with us and we would be happy to have you as a part of the not only the NJOF family but the National Juneteenth the National Juneteenth Miss Juneteenth pageant oh scholarship program <laughs> and help, help us help us honor our queen when you see us put her image up share that image this is one young lady we need to be very very proud of extremely thank you and also to Miss Opal as well, as she walks to bring awareness. Absolutely. And don't forget our father of this all, the Reverend Ronald B. Myers, Senior MD, who traveled this country and the world, bringing attention to Juneteenth like no other. Absolutely. The doc took it and brought it from Israel to Africa to Asia, everywhere he went, Alaska, anywhere he went and pursued mm -hmm. Juneteenth. So. Let's not forget Doc Myers. And without yes, we him, love him. him. Absolutely, we love him. Um, State Representative Greenwood, who have held in the whole time, ma'am. Your input <laughs> has been invaluable. Do you have any final words or thoughts to leave us with on Black History Month as we reflect on the importance of Juneteenth? Um, I'm just here to assist Stephanie as always. So anything that you need from me to push this forward, I'm here to help. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. Senator Belt, sir, any final thoughts? I would agree. Uh, just let me know what we need to do. Uh, the, the, the whole governance experience means that it has to come out of one of the 
one of the chambers and go past the other. So with us being here, you have the House represented and you have the Senate represented. So just let us know what we need to do and <laughs> we'll get it done. You have both houses represented. Yeah, okay. Thank you, yeah, sir. Yeah. So we in the house, sir. <laughs> we, you're in the you you're you're in the proverbial house. Okay. Mr. Belt, <laughs> Mr. Mr. Belt, Mr. Greenwood, Mr. Belt, and, and, and Mr. Greenwood, please make sure you um get in contact with D Evans, our communications director. We want to make sure we can work closely with you guys and give you all the support that the national can to get the program going. Ready, huh? Okay. Absolutely. Uh, okay, and you. before we go on, I want to make sure that we give opportunity for any municipality, um, Mayor Curtis McCall, Francella Jackson, we would love to hear any final thoughts from the two of you out of that beautiful village of Cahokia. And mm -hmm. as we talk about moving forward and loving it, is it now time to say anything about a new name? Can we do that yet? <laughs> I've been bubbling <laughs> over. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess. Uh, well, first, let me just say that uh, it's been an honor to be here today. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, as an educator myself, it's been very enlightening to hear the uh, the wisdom and the knowledge given by Mr. Williams, as well as the uh, efforts that uh, State Rep Greenwood and Senator Belt are doing on the higher level to uh, kind of uh, counteract the uh, the whitewash of the curriculum as well as in the uh, criminal justice and the health uh, reform area, as we know that these disparities are there. So just was very enlightening today. I, I was a pleasure to be here. Thank you, uh, Stephanie Terrence, for always having the Village of Cahokia's uh, best uh, back out here. And we appreciate you guys. And I guess, yes, uh, it would be a, a great time to just go ahead and announce that, uh, yes, we can officially call ourselves now Cahokia Heights. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> Way to get oh, that no. job done. <laughs> so the election uh, that was had on uh, last November, this past November, uh, which there was a referendum on the ballot to consolidate the areas of the village of Cahokia, the city of Centerville, Illinois, and the uh, village of Allerton, Illinois, into one municipality. And then it, it overwhelmingly passed. And so, yes, uh, yes we are now Cahokia Heights. So uh, watch out for every Heights. We're coming. Higher <laughs> Heights. Higher yeah. Heights. Higher Heights. It's beautiful. <laughs> Absolutely. We also want to uh, wait, recognize... Wait, Ms. Jackson was going oh, to say Oh, go ahead, Francella. Well. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, can you guys hear me? I did unmute myself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I just want to. I just want to again thank you guys for this opportunity. You know, it's it's just been wonderful. And also, and I know I keep talking about Mayor Curtis McCall, but I'm telling you, he <laughs> has done just tremendous things in East St. Louis, which made it possible for the city of Cahokia Heights when he first declared June 10th day in the village of Cahokia, the first mayor in this area, mm -hmm. unfortunately, we still have work to do because we had people that looked like us asking, what was Juneteenth? Wow. And then also, yeah. let's not be food. I think these 400 years taught us something. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the slaves were free from the plantation and slave masters, but guess what? Those sons, grandsons, great-grandsons, great-great-grandsons, their legacies are in those boardrooms. They run these prisons, they run these healthcare systems and things like that. So we cannot be fooled by that. We still want to end systemic racism. And it's so great to hear about our state legislators and what they are doing because they look like us yeah. and they're promoting mm -hmm. our agenda. And I think back when I went to Ghana, Africa in the late eighties to go to that door of no return and go through those slave mm -hmm. castles. I grew tired mm -hmm. of being tired of being tired. I've had some rest then, and I'm mm. ready. People mm. fought for equality, but like so many others on this call, I want equity. And we oh, said we're going to get the good note. So the good note mm. is, ha! Huh. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
It's beautiful. It's beautiful. <laughs> and I do want to say all over the nation, we are really looking to have our divine nine in any capacity help to help get us to carry this torch. We need help bringing light to Juneteenth. So we do want y'all to consider that as well. I'm putting that out there now. Um, what about uh, Mayor Banks? Do you have anything that you would like to add? No, uh, I don't. Just what Francella said. <laughs> okay, now Mayor Banks, you guys yeah. found um, y'all found Mother Baltimore's um, headstone. Y'all gave her a headstone out there, didn't you? Well, you know what? I don't know. I I don't want to claim something that I'm really not. Um, you know, to have knowledge about. And mm -hmm. um, I went to Bell Fountain mm -hmm. and over to that cemetery over by uh, West Florissant looking. I never found a headstone or anything. Uh, and if someone else did, they didn't share it with me. Wow. And then we do have a couple of our, um, our, our organizations that, you know, roll with us. And, and we support that are on the line as well, Stephanie. Right. I'm going to have Mr. Um, Savage uh, give us a final thought. And then I would like to get some evaluations from some of our advocates because we are diverse, we are inclusive, and we are fortunate enough to have advocates that really do care and that really are our friends. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Savage is off the line. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Anyone? I'm gonna I'm gonna call on um, Jessica Motzinger to unmute herself and give me an uh, opinion of what you thought today, ma'am. Because <laughs> I know she always does talk. That's my girl. So, ah! what did you think at all today? <laughs> Actually, no, I, I really appreciate like learning new history and stuff. And a lot of people don't realize, like uh, Mr. Williams was discussing about the, the black soldiers that were down in Galveston. A lot of people don't know that. Now, I mean, it's outstanding. Every time I hear something new and gain new knowledge, outstanding, y'all. And thank you, right. Senator Belt, and thank you, Representative Greenwood, and everybody for showing up. This is really outstanding, and we do need to push it, especially if you go online and read some comments. So. Right, and I told, yeah. I told Jessica in the comments, I said, Indivisible, we got to mount up and get ready to show our support for our mm -hmm. leaders, do whatever is necessary to counteract any negativity when that's yes. not even necessary. I see Joel right. Funk there. Yeah, you see, we got yeah, another you gotta, guy. You got to unmute yourself now, Joel. <laughs> unmute yourself. <laughs> How y'all doing? Can you, you hear me? What did you think about today? What are you doing? Some work out in your yard? Yeah, it's a, it's a little cold out, so I got to put some wood in the furnace, and uh, I got to grab some eggs before. Y'all, he got, he right he has an egg farm, y'all. So, mm. so Stephanie, Stephanie and Terrence, I got one more thing to say before we get off the call. Sure. Okay. I don't right. know if you, oh, Please. well, uh, let me tell you how the leader of Bear McCall is. He, he leads, he leads, and he wanted me to make an announcement, but I was like, no. And that's just speaks his leadership skills. He, he doesn't mind right. sharing. Yeah. This, but, but he, he called me with something, and 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 I'm not going to announce it. I'm going to call on my boss. <laughs> 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 yeah. And Joel. It is wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, Francella. I, I appreciate your time no, today. He's got, He's got something to say. Can sure. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> Listen, guys, uh, after today's conversation, I can I can officially say that uh, we will be acknowledging the village. Of, uh, we will be acknowledging Juneteenth uh, this year and for here on out as an official holiday in the village of Cahokia. <laughs> Man, and you deserve it. You deserve it. You That's are, right. like I said, amazing. You are totally <laughs> amazing. Uh, yeah, you know, right. And then Senator Bell, he's from Cahokia. He wrote a book. He didn't even bring yeah, he up from his East book. <laughs> well, we took him over here in East St. Look, I yeah. think we tried to take him. I'm, I'm, I'm from Tuneville. 
in a little area <laughs> called Golden Garden, which is synonymous with okay. God's country. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, Joel, we, we weren't able to hear what you had to say, Joel, because your mic kept cutting in and out. What did you oh, think yeah. about today, Joel? Yeah, can, can you hear me now? I, uh, hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> um, yeah, no, the day was great. I, uh, I, I definitely love hearing uh, not just what we're doing at the legislative level, uh, but what y'all are doing at the activist level to, you know, to continue to push the conversation forward. And um, my wife keeps on trying to call me. This is uh, oh. <laughs> um, uh, to push the conversation forward, and, and also to see where I can plug in. You know, as time goes on, um, you know, not just within the county, but in my local community too. Uh, to, to be an advocate for change uh, right. and, and to bring all of us up. All right. Thank you. Um, Cindy McMullen, would you like to add your two cents? What did you think today? <laughs> Moms demand action against gun violence. I, I would love to add my two cents worth. Um, first of all, first of all, I do want to say I grew up in Cahokia. Um, mm -hmm. Graduated high school there in '78, um, and I could um, tell a few stories too um, about uh, encounters with racism only from the flip side, unfortunately, okay. um, but I won't, I won't. Um, but I did want to tell, <laughs> I, will, I did want to say to, to um, uh, Mayor McCall, just congratulations. Um, and I'm just so happy to see that, that he is, you know, he, he was elected mayor and uh, just to see the progress there. Um, I am just, I, I, I tell you, when I see this, this, uh, all the faces here, um, how this has grown, the collaboration has grown with this. You guys have just done a stupendous job at promoting this and, and it just keeps growing and growing and getting better and better. And I'm, I'm just tickled pink to sit here and to see all these, these amazing people coming together and talking about learning um, things I, you know, I didn't know. It was just a very wonderful um, couple of hours here. And I just thank you for uh, putting this on. And I think it was just an, an awesome, awesome job. So thank you. Thank you so much. You, and then Barbara, aren't you from the Southwestern Democratic uh, Women's Group? Unmute yourself and decloak, baby, with that pretty <laughs> hair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You can tell, okay. What, it's been a yeah. while. <laughs> what did you think today? I, I just thought it was absolutely wonderful. I learned a lot. Uh, like I said in the uh, chat box, uh, you can't learn this stuff in school. No. And it's nobody's fault that we're, that's here, but what we can do is to strive to make it change to where we can read these stories. Everybody has a right to know this and to have a pride yeah, in their ancestry. And it's just wrong that we take it away from people. And Barbara, what group are you with? Well, I'm with the Southwest Illinois Democrat Women, but I'm also with the Illinois Democrat Women. Right. We got uh, Juliana in office with that one there, didn't we? Hey, hey. <laughs> 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 I, I just wanted to throw in that and Karen. I'm always messing with you, Barb. You know, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> and Karen okay. Sandifer. Okay, I'm not gonna uh I'm still gonna stay dark, but um I the word <laughs> that keeps popping out at me and I guess it this whole thing has helped me to clarify the meaning of equity and uh that's probably my biggest concern um the actual i looked up the definition it said <laughs> that it's really about what people need because if there's a a debt a deficit then you you can't just do equality you have to give some people more than other because they are in more need so that's that's the big thing that i'm taking away today i did sign the petition i shared it and i think that the juneteenth is gonna for me it's important because it's a chance to celebrate a very important moment in our history to reflect and to rededicate ourselves to pro to progress 
So it, it just needs to be a national holiday for those reasons. And I'm sure I'm leaving something out, but, and I'm looking forward, I guess I'm going to speak as Sierra club. Cause I think I'm the, yeah. You know, and so then add in there our book drive real quick and do yes, it um, well, real fast. Yeah, look, okay. <laughs> look on CBSS or Sierra club Cascadia group. We're trying to, um, uh, buy books and we have a list of suggestions where if you want to buy them from this independent book dealer, that is when you look for the, um, promotional uh, the promotion for it you'll find the book dealer um trying to buy local in illinois and then uh to donate we're focusing more on third graders or the reading levels around that age group and um hopefully get enough that we can give them to uh, all the children absolutely um and then uh so somehow, yeah, and we're working with CDSS and Sierra, group, uh, Sierra Club is working together on that because um, C CDSS has that connection to the school district. So we try to collaborate like that. Um, and then also my dream is to uh, <laughs> donate peach trees at some all point. Right. I'm thinking peach trees. But yeah, that's all I, I'll yeah. say right now, I guess. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, if there's anyone else, I am East St. Louis. If you have a final word, you know, we love your word. And then we're closing out, sir. He's gone. Okay. All right, then. So we are. Dr. Turnip Seed. Oh, Dr. Turnip Seed. Hi, yeah. sis. Go ahead. <laughs> Hey y'all! <laughs> greetings <Hi>. from <laughs> wait a minute. Greetings from South Mrs. South Chicago or South Illinois, <laughs> Mississippi. Since you all are North Mississippi, I guess we're South Illinois. But um, I did want to say thank you so much for such a wonderful, uh, pleasant surprise on this very cold day here, even in right. uh, Mississippi. And it just warms my heart to see the reception and the embracing of our culture, our narrative, and the way that it is um, being promoted on the political uh, front as well. And so thank you all for the work that you're doing. And I do want to invite you to our podcast this afternoon. I'm going to copy and paste the link. We will have Please. on this very special Valentine's Day a Love Supreme presentation by Dr. Al Gurrier from Las Vegas, and he's going to talk about um, our youth, our truth, our love. So that's our love supreme. So I'll, I'll paste the link okay. in the chat right now. Thank you very much, Dr. Turnipsey, for getting that message out. Again, you know, all things Juneteenth, and we must support each other and help to get the message out. So much respect and love to all that you do. Thank you. Thank you, Queen, for gracing us with your presence. Thank you, Sylvia, for all that you do to keep us abreast of all things dealing with pageants, pageantry, and sticking together. We love you as well. We love all of our guests today. And if you would like to be part of Juneteenth, if you would like to learn more about our programs, connect to future events, help advocate for Juneteenth, learn about Illinois Juneteenth Committee or our National Foundation, please send me an email at sbush at cdss-esl.org. You can also call or leave a text message at 618 514-3199. A new people, a new freedom, a new star bursting over the horizon. We were ever changed by the events of history. And we look forward to greatness. So this is not the end. We crossed that out, y'all, because it is just the beginning. <laughs> this was brought to you by Community <laughs> Development Sustainable Solutions, pillar of excellence for the state of Illinois when it comes to dealing with structural racism, crime, and violence. By Juneteenth, East St. Louis.
and our new, newly developed Illinois Juneteenth Committee. All things Juneteenth, y'all. Together we rise. All things Juneteenth. All things Juneteenth. <laughs> Thank y'all so much. Bye bye, everyone. <laughs> All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Have a great rest thank of your weekend, y'all. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> Happy bye -bye. Valentine's Day, everybody. Happy Love you all. Day. Love you yeah. all. Love you. <laughs>